Um, yes, so my name is Chris Manson Witten from Progressive Energy. Uh, our mission as Progressive Energy is to take millions of tonnes per annum of CO2 out of the energy system. And we were formed 25 years ago, it's our 25th anniversary this year, to do CCS and hydrogen. So um, hopefully our time has now come. It's not just those, but those are the key areas that we are involved in. And very interestingly, from the discussion this morning, you know, there was a talk about how do you make big projects happen and the importance of collaboration. But actually, I'd say also the importance of catalysts. So um, you do need big companies in order to make things happen. They've got the heft, the power, the, the, the financial ability, but actually you need the catalysts to get projects going. And that's what we like to think of ourselves as at Progressive Energy. Now, as I start, this is a graph, I mean, I've shown it many times. I will note it is slightly out of date, but actually I don't think it makes a huge difference. And you'll see though why I want to use it. It is a chart from the Committee on Climate Change, and that is looking at the UK territorial emissions uh, of greenhouse gases over a period of, you know, uh, sort of almost, almost two decades. And you can see that we have made very good progress. Yes, that isn't going quite up to date, but to be honest, the last few years have been a bit, bit odd in terms of our economic uh, productivity and things like that. But you can see we have made very good progress on our territorial admission, emissions. What is not necessarily as good is what our UK consumption emissions are. And predominantly, what that is adding on there is the emissions embodied in the stuff that we use. And I think we can take away a couple of really important pointers from this. First of all, it goes to demonstrate just quite how much emissions are embedded in that stuff. So whether it is the foundation industry, so the core materials that we use to make things, or whether it is indeed the the process of making things that we all use and consume. So first of all, the magnitude is important. But I think the other thing it tells us is there's a real economic opportunity. This is stuff that is made elsewhere around the world where we have been out competed in order to actually deliver those things. But as we move to a low carbon economy, the driver will be to get that stuff to have a low carbon impact. Now, if we have the infrastructure, the facilities, the desire, the regulatory framework, we have the ability to tap into that market. And if we can decarbonize our industry in our jurisdiction, and I'm talking here in the UK, but the same flows for any country where they have those kind of policies, that is a market that can be created. This is not just an environmental story, it is an economic story. If we look at Chris Skidmore's report, he very much drew that link between the two. I just wanted to use that as a bit of backdrop. I will now tell you a little bit about HiNet. Some of you will be aware of the project. I will give you, give you a kind of overview of it. But in the course of doing that, I will also update you as to where we are. There's lots of exciting things that have been happening over the, over the last few weeks, let alone uh, over the last few months. So HiNet is a track one industrial cluster. That means that the UK government has selected, and in fact that was October 2021, selected HiNet in the Northwest as one of its first two industrial decarbonisation clusters. Um, and the core providers of that infrastructure are shown on the left hand side. It is the consortium that is delivering that. So ourselves as the catalysts, as I talked about earlier, ENI is the provider of the underlying CO2 transport storage infrastructure, and that is the foundation upon the rest, which the rest is built, because that is taking away CO2 and permanently storing it. But then that infrastructure goes more widely. So uh, yes, there are users of that infrastructure, we'll talk about that in a minute, but one of those users is the production of low carbon hydrogen, and then with low carbon hydrogen, also comes infrastructure. How do we get the hydrogen from one place to another? How do we get the benefits of hydrogen, which is large scale volume storage, so that then you can provide a new low carbon energy infrastructure? But what is really key is this project is led by demand. What you can see on the right hand side are the users of that infrastructure, and they're broadly divided into two groups. There is a group for whom they have unavoidable CO2 emissions, and what they want to do is to capture them and sequester them permanently. 
and a group for whom what the most economic and sensible thing to do is that they currently burn a fuel in order to do whatever their process is, and by taking a low carbon fuel they can transition, and by doing so they go low carbon, effectively taking low carbon hydrogen. Yes, at volume initially from, from blue hydrogen, from C2S enabled hydrogen, but increasingly over time, there will be a transition as the form of hydrogen changes. But you can see some really big brands here, and right at the end, I'll do a short two minute video, which hopefully just gives you some insights from some of those users as to what, what the system looks like from their perspective. So this is what that infrastructure is. We are looking to ultimately generate around four gigawatts worth of low carbon hydrogen production, which will collect all those, all those industrial and power and generation plants. It will be connected via a large scale hydrogen pipeline distribution system, new build distribution system, a hydrogen storage capacity, which really uses the capabilities that we have in the Northwest in terms of our geology. And then we have a raft of industrial capture facilities with the transport and storage of that CO2 in order to enable the infrastructure. So I'm going to pick through each of those elements. Uh, but before I do that, I need to then update you as to where we were on the announcements that took place about a month ago. So those of you who are listening here in the UK, we had our spring statement. And the Chancellor announced £20 billion worth of funding for CCS and CCS clusters. That is game-changing. I've been involved in CCS since 2005. We had a previous competition that was around 2010 to 2012, which then moved on to 2015 and then stopped. That was £1 billion worth of funding. This is £20 billion worth of committed funding, predominantly revenue funding rather than capital funding, which is exactly what we as industry want. So that's one big game-changer that happened then. And then about two, three weeks ago, the, class, the capture projects on that selected cluster were then announced too. And as far as HiNet was concerned, we actually had a very, very good set of announcements. Five of our projects were then selected, and I'll tell you a little bit about them, as capture projects to be taken into the next stage of negotiations with government. And between them, they will capture around 3 million tonnes of carbon dioxide from industry each year. These will be the first projects off the ramp, along with a few projects from the East Coast as well. They will be the first projects off the rank industrially in the UK. So this is the CO2 transport and storage. And this is, this is owned, led by e and I. Um, and they own the offshore fields in Liverpool Bay. They are disused gas fields or gas fields coming to the end of their economic life. They are converting them in order to be able to take CO2 rather than producing gas. And with that, then also is required a CO2 pipeline. What you can see in red is an existing pipeline used for natural gas, which will be transformed into a CO2 pipeline. And then in blue is a relatively short section compared with the overall length, including offshore, of new build CO2 pipeline that will be needed. The engineering de uh, design is well advanced. We are in the consenting process already. That has been submitted. Uh, and we are in the determination of that at the moment. And as far as the offshore is concerned, that storage license has already been awarded because this is one of those early projects. What is interesting then is to look about the projects that are connected. So different types of capture projects that will be connected to the infrastructure, denoted by the colour. And then the stars actually de denote the, type, the, the projects that have been um, awarded the position to go into negotiation for, for what we need. So starting over on the left-hand side, we have Pageswood Cement. That's a, a facility where we will be capturing 800,000 tonnes of CO2 per annum. The cement sector accounts for somewhere between 7 and 8% of global emissions, so is an absolutely vital sector to decarbonise. But also importantly, because of the chemical process that takes place, inevitably produces CO2. Yes, you can fuel switch away amount, around a third of those, those CO2 emissions by using biogenic feedstocks and things like that. But fundamentally, two thirds of that comes from the chemical process. You have to capture CO2. This will be a world leading plant that will be able to do that. So that's Pageswood Cement. There is actually another small uh, lime and cement sector project as well, which is Buxton Lime Net Zero. That's a relatively small project looking at some quite innovative new ways of capturing CO2 from that process. Again, underpinning that foundation industry. We've got 
Up at the top, we have Runcorn uh, Energy Re Recovery Facility. So that is the largest energy from waste plant in the UK, emitting around a million tonnes of CO2. That will be captured and permanently sequestered. What is really interesting is, of course, a big chunk of that is actually biogenic in ultimate source. So when you take your residual waste, around 50% of that has come from biogenic materials. So arguably, not actually part of the, the funding regime, this is funding as an industrial project, you are actually getting a level of greenhouse gas reduction technology almost for free launching in terms of that. And then we have another slightly smaller but still significant energy from waste plant uh, within Cyclis, which is around 400,000 tonnes that will also be connecting to the infrastructure. And then finally, we have the low carbon hydrogen facility by Vertex, which is a joint venture between ourselves and SR, the refinery. So I will now start picking through each of those, or picking through from, from Vertex onto the next part of the infrastructure. So as Vertex, we undertook a feed, which was now completed at the back end of 2021. So it is the only large scale CCUS enabled hydrogen plant in the UK to have totally completed its feed for its first line. And ultimately we'll be looking to deliver a gigawatt of, of, of hydrogen production uh, in the first wave, uh, which is split into two lines. Now that first line of 350 megawatts has already been invited to enter into negotiations with government. We are in a position where we submitted our consents almost two years ago. We've done the feed. That project is going to be ready to go and first off the rank. I'll unpack a few of the challenges a little bit later. Uh, just to demonstrate we are not purely about CCS enabled hydrogen, ourselves in a collaboration with Stackcraft and Foresight are developing a suite of electrolytic hydrogen projects as well. So that includes a 28, 28 megawatt project which will use renewable electricity from, from the Foresight wind farm that you can see there, Frodsham. Um, and that is an initial phase of comprising around 100 megawatts by the time you add the other projects in that will reduce the carbon intensity of industrials using that low carbon hydrogen. How do we get the, the, the hydrogen to its users and how do we develop the infrastructure? Now, the ver first vertex line is just delivering to, to, to adjacent users of the vertex facility. In order to reach that wider list of users, we need a hydrogen distribution system. This is being delivered by Cadent. The feed is well underway. The DCO consultations have already been completed. That will be going in for application during the course of this year. This will be the first 100, 120 kilometer dedicated hydrogen pipeline uh, in the UK. To do that, we're gonna need a business model. We'll talk about business models, no doubt, but actually this business model is one of the less developed ones. How do we get this funded in order to make it happen? But government sees the importance, we need that to happen. And similarly, we have Innovin, who will be providing geological storage of hydrogen. Uh, that feed engineering is underway, is pretty much completed. In fact, its consents have already been granted because it's transitioning from a natural gas consent to a hydrogen one. The volume of storage in there is transformatory. That will be storing 1,300 gigawatt hours of energy. If I were to put that in other terms, if you turned every passenger vehicle in the UK into a Nissan Leaf at around 40 kilowatt hours of storage in those vehicles, that would be about the same amount of energy storage as you get from this facility here it will make a noticeable difference to the UK's just straightforward energy, energy storage, energy reserves, let alone the fact that it's low carbon. And then how do our users gain confidence that they can be able to use that hydrogen? So we've undertaken trials at Pilkington, and I know we've got Paul speaking a little bit later. Um, so we undertook trials, uh, uh, well now two years ago, at the Greengate Works, so looking at taking uh, the, their existing furnaces and running core parts of those at 100% hydrogen and running the whole facility, undertaken by Tommy, who will be speaking a little bit later, on a blend of hydrogen as well. We also did work at Port Sunlight, so the Easter before last, their entire site for a period of a week, 10 days, all the steam raised across that site was on 100% hydrogen. We've now then done some further feasibility studies at some well-known names that you can see there under the IFS program, 
in order to work through with these organizations. What are the barriers? How can they convert to run on 100% hydrogen? And what we've got there is uh, Steve, Ro Steve Rotherham, who's the mayor of Liverpool, up at, uh, up at Pilkington and, uh, and seeing the trials as we were running them. Now, I'm now going to just pick up two things. First of all, where are we and what are, the, what are the challenges that we see, which I'm sure we're going to pick up in our discussion, and then a very short video. So planning and consents, we are well advanced in those but they take time. I have to say, one of our regulatory bodies has taken almost two years to respond to statutory consultations. Not because there were big issues that were raised, but just the time it has taken and the level of resource that they have. That holds things up. Now, the fact that we submitted our consents almost two years ago puts us in a really strong position, but it is a challenge. We do need the legislation. The energy bill here in the UK is absolutely vital. Some really important things going through, and that must land because that is what enables us to sign commercial contracts. And again, I think in the discussion, we'll, no doubt we'll pick up the different business models to enable it, where the risks are, where the opportunities are, and how does the UK position against what's happening globally. So before I finish, and uh, you should never work with children, animals, or videos in presentations, I'm really hoping that this is going to work. Here in the North West and North Wales, we sit at the heart of the UK's manufacturing economy, creating many of the things we use in our daily lives. The UK business sector accounts for around one-fifth of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions, and reducing these emissions to net zero is a tough challenge, but HiNet is making it happen. Decarbonisation is very important to us at Pilkington. Low carbon hydrogen gives us a way of instantly decarbonising how we make glass. We were the world's first glass manufacturer to trial hydrogen power and we were impressed that high volume production at high quality continued unabated. Our partnership with HiNet will put us at the forefront of innovation as we take this step to decarbonise how we make glass. At PepsiCo, we're fully committed to greenhouse gas reduction which is why we're aiming to be net zero by 2040 as part of our PET positive sustainability goals. With many much loved brands from Walkers and Doritos to Pepsi and Quaker, we want to focus on powering how we produce our snacks and beverages in a sustainable way. Here at our site in Skelmersdale, HiNet gives us the capability to use low carbon hydrogen to produce our snacks, helping us meet our carbon reduction targets by 2030. HiNet gives us the opportunity to use low carbon hydrogen at our Wrexham and Trafford Park plants. The hydrogen will be generated just up the road in Ellesmere Port, giving us a source of locally produced fuel. This allows Kellogg's to decarbonise how we produce our much loved products from cornflakes to crunchy nut. Kellogg's is committed to increasing the amount of low carbon energy we use in our plants and reducing our carbon footprint wherever possible. At Ensa, we will use HiNet's low carbon hydrogen in our furnaces to create billions of ultra low carbon glass bottles for wine, beer, soft drinks, water and food. This means we will grow as a business, creating at least 200 jobs and future proofing existing roles. HiNet will help us to decarbonise so we can meet our zero emission targets and create the world's most sustainable glass bottles. From the mid 2020s, HiNet will enable the UK's vital industry to move from fossil fuel gas to low carbon hydrogen. It will also provide a route for companies to capture and lock away their carbon emissions. The North West and North Wales are at the forefront of the UK's low carbon hydrogen transition. We are proud to be making it happen. Hopefully that's given you a window of how, uh, how our users see HiNet. And I think two important things from there. First of all, these are products that we are using on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we are engaging with those around us, these are the kind of messages that we can be putting out. This is how we can decarbonize. And secondly, I hope you took from there, yes, there are core financial decisions that are driving big companies to work out how to decarbonize but there are wider drivers. It is not just stick. There is a carrot. These companies' customers want a decarbonized solution, and that's what we can provide. Thank you. For a non-English engineer uh, to speak after Chris. 
So permit me to speak slowly during the next 10 minutes. Um, you know, this is the commitment of CEPSA for the next uh, eight years. We are fully committed in the company in order to reduce the, our CO2 emissions in our scope one and scope two from now to 2030 in a 55%. And also we are fully committed to achieve the net zero from now to 2050. In order to do that, we are going to use all the technology levers that are close to our hands. So we are going to use the renewable power production. We are going to implement energy efficiency initiative because still there is energy efficiency possibilities in all the industrial sectors. Also, we are going to impulse the biogas, internal consumption of biogas using residues to produce biocombustible. At the same time, we are going to produce biogas. We are going to impulse the electrification. First, we are going to begin with the electrification of our steam. After, we are going to go with the electrification of our thermal oil. And at the end, we hope to be successful in electrification of our process heaters. Also, for sure, we want to transform 100% of our fossil hydrogen production into green hydrogen production. Also, we are going to reduce production in some of our upstream assets. And with all of that, we are going to try, we are going to impulse a, a real action plan in order to achieve this 55%. But we are not only committed with our internal consumption. You know that in the gas and oil industry, the big red elephant in the room is the use CO2 emissions of our clients. So we are also committed to reduce the carbon footprint of all the energy products that we are going to sell to our clients in the next eight years. And we want to reduce our carbon intensity index of the energy products that we sell to our clients between a 15 to 20 percent in this decade. And in order to do that, we are today co-processing residues in our present installations. We are building up new biofuels installation in order to produce new renewable uh, combustibles. We are going to build up new green hydrogen plant. We are going to impulse the biogas solution. We are going to sell renewable power to our uh, mobility clients. And obviously, we are going to be helped by the decarbonization of our scope one and scope two. I hope to achieve 20%, but we have to be decided to be a little bit less um, uh, ambitious with this bracket of 15 to 20%. But believe me, if I can, I will, we will achieve 20%. How we are going to do that? Um, with a new uh, cluster where we are going to produce renewable combustible in Andalusia. We are going to use the two present energy parks that we have in Andalusia, one in Cadiz and one in Huelva, in order to impulse renewable combustible production. And how we are going to do that? First, renewable power production. We are going to impulse projects in order to be able to produce between seven to eight giga watts of renewable power production in the south of Spain. This is the first step of a very energy transition uh, process. Also, we are going to impulse the production up to 2.5 million tons of renewable combustible using residues, vegetable or animals or others or plastics. The first, this, this action, the, the first action, renewable power production is ongoing. The second one is also ongoing because a first phase, 500,000 um, HBO plants are going to be built in Huelva in the next three years. And also we are already today co-processing vegetables residues in our present fossil installation. Almost 500 million tons of residues are already be transformed in our installation into renewable combustible. Also, we want to build up to two gigawatts of green hydrogen in our two facilities, one gigawatt in Huelva, one gigawatt in, in San Roque. As we explained previously, the first client are going to be CEPSA. 
So we want to transform our hydrogen fossil consumption into green hydrogen consumption. This is the best way in order to get knowledge and to get um, reliability in, in the stakeholders and in the society. So first, we are going to transform our, our hydrogen consumption. And after, we are going to use this green hydrogen in order to produce chemicals, in order to produce combustible for marine transport, to produce combustible for heavy road transport uh, clients, and obviously for aviation. Sustainable aviation fuel is one of our priorities, being in the south of Spain, where tourists are one of the first industry. And at the end, we are going to supply renewable power production to our mobility clients. Uh, why Andalusia? First, because we have two energy parks in Andalusia and we have to transform them into renewable energy parks. Second, because Spain is the second largest renewable power producer in, in Europe. So it's the right place to be there using green electrons to transform it into other sources of combustible. Also because Cadiz and San Roque in Cadiz and Huelva are strategically located close to big ports and we are, have a privileged access to northwestern market, to West Africa and to even to America, South and North America. So we are strategically, strategically located in order to transport this new renewable combustible to any part of the world. Also, because we have self-consumption of hydrogen. Uh, as we have explained previously, it's very important to have this self-consumption in order to develop the technology in the coming years where other sectors are not going to be ready to consume big volumes of hydrogen. And the end, but not uh, less important, is because we have the knowledge. We have been working with uh, residues in order to produce uh, renewable combustible during the last 10 years. We have been working with the hydrogen during almost the last century. So we know very well the problems of the hydrogen and how to transport and how to manage and all the safety issues that we have with the hydrogen. And also because we have very well uh, trained employees and we have the operation, the maintenance and the engineering capabilities to do so. And to conclude, what we need. Um, first, the renewable combustible production sites at the end are industry. So we need permitting. So we need from all the government agencies, regional, federal, local agencies to speed up the permitting process. If not, we are not going to be able to comply with our commitments. So we need support from all the government agencies in order to achieve our goals. Also, we need a very big and very important improvement of the national grid. We have to produce renewable power production, we have to produce green electrons, and we have to transport these electrons to our new production sites. So this is also very important. The new renewable combustible has to be competitive. So we need a, a special treatment on the OPEX. It's extremely important to have good OPEX in order to not to lose competitive in our this renewable combustible. The market is asking for them. So the only thing that we have to achieve is to have renewable power production at, a, at reasonable prices. Also, we are in the age of sun technologies, so we need support also in order to permit us to develop these new renewable technologies. And to permit from the, from the European agencies to maintain biofuels and biogas as combustibles. Uh, we cannot see how we are going to change 100% of the industrial fleet and the private fleet from now to 2035. So we, we are going to work 
in order to convince authorities that biocombustibles are going to be the perfect transition combustible in order to achieve the energy transition. Today, already, almost 20% of the carbon footprint of this combustible has been reduced during the last 10 years. So it's a good opportunity to use this combustible as transition fuels. And basically that's it. That's uh, the reason why we are in Andalusia and this is our plans. Thank you. Chris, thank you both. Um, and I do want to open up the floor and we do have people with microphones. Yeah, who are going to be looking for people with raised hands, please. But whilst, whilst we're preparing that, there's one there already, but uh, my, I'm going to take my privilege as chair to ask the first question. And, and actually what we see there is actually two quite contrasting but similar presentations on, on and, and, and again from this morning, we are doing, we are doing now rather than just planning. Um, but, but, but one talk emphasised very much a collaboration between many partners. Uh, in your case, uh, Miguel, and so the question to you first is, how, how are you finding that process of, of working with the right partners in the Hydrogen Valley in Andalusia? Uh, we, we have to cooperate with uh, suppliers. We have to cooperate with equipment manufacturers. And we have to have alliance with our clients because we have to um, to try to obtain firm commitments for these new products. If you don't have a long-term contract, assuring that we are going to be able to solve these products, are going to be very difficult to develop it. Because of that, in order to develop the hydrogen, we have we, we, we decided to become with ourselves because it's the, the best way in order to obtain volumes required in order to make profitable this new technology. Thank you. And, and to you both, so maybe Chris this time first, um, very clearly the relationship with the government is quite important here. Uh, and it's a difficult process when, you, when you're trying to get regulatory permission. <laughs> in an area where we all know what we're doing. Here it's new, we're learning, and, and actually government is learning too. Um, can, can you touch on that? Sure, yeah. okay, so I guess there's two parts. There's how do you get the economics right and how do you actually then deliver things? And I would say the UK government has a strong history of putting in reliable, resilient support regimes. So the CFDs that we have for offshore wind are well proven, have provided, yes, funds, but actually stability in revenues. And I'm pleased to say that in general, those business models that are being developed are based on a similar basis. So our financial institutions trust the counterparties of the LCCC, they trust the system. So I think that's good, but we are developing new infrastructure and a new vector. I mean, hydrogen and CO2 are both things we haven't had to put infrastructure down before. So there are challenges, there are risk allocations that need to be between government, what's in the national good, and what can the private sector bear. So I think there's a suite of issues, opportunities there. And then the other one you touch on, I, I'm really sorry, but I think our regulators are underpowered resource-wise at the moment. It's not, I mean, people use hydrogen all the time in the chemicals industry. It is a known commodity, they know how to do it. But the challenge, as you say, is there's enough business as usual stuff to regulate, let alone a, a swathe of new projects. Mm. And what we really need is financial and, and people resource in those regulatory bodies to keep up. Mm. Okay. In our case, it's exactly the same. Uh, government is very focused. Is uh, really, they are supporting a lot the, the, the project in the south of uh, of Spain, but um, you know, one, one thing is the political approach, another thing is the technical approach. So we have to work with the technicians of the government in order to obtain the, the permitting. And at the end, uh, it's not only the it's, the permitting is not only the the government; it's the the whole society that has to be focused on on the fact that we don't have any other alternative that to develop these new projects. 
at the end, an hydrogen renewable hydrogen plant is exactly the same that a fossil hydrogen plant is from from 500 meters. There is not big difference. So, um, you know, we we need to convince um, the the whole stakeholders that are excellent projects in order to develop the economy and in order to develop the energy independency and the industry in Europe. We don't want to be only a tourist site. We want to maintain our industry. Yes, have you got the... Can you introduce yourself, please, as well? Um, Oops. Joris Mertens, uh, KBC. Um, well, thank you, Miguel and uh, Chris, for uh, excellent presentations. I got a question for Chris regarding the the hydrogen grid um, about balancing and pricing. Because I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you will have one price for the consumers of the hydrogen supplied. So how will that be established? And then the producers have probably different costs. So, and then the question is also how will be the header be balanced? Who will do that? Okay, so two really important questions. The first one is on the pricing. So the UK government recognises it needs to catalyse a change. And what it has done is put in a support regime which places a reference price floor for hydrogen to be the same as natural gas. So it actually allows consumers to buy hydrogen at the price of natural gas, which means that they are seeing the carbon benefits of that delta and the point is that carbon benefit is designed to provide them with the economic incentive to make the changes in order to do that. So that is how it will start to begin to start with. There are some, some useful bells and whistles to allow a producer to negotiate a slightly higher price and the producer gets a bit of that benefit, government gets a bit, but, that, but that's fundamentally it. Over time, uh, I am sure that, well, they, the plan will be that there is then a more market driven. Once there is a market reference price for hydrogen, like there is for natural gas or electricity, then the reference price will become that. The expectation is producers sell at that market reference price, and then the subsidy is against that rather than against natural gas. So that's, that's the answer to your, to your first question. In terms of balancing, uh, so our initial project which is very local, is going to be between the producer and the users. And there's going to be a you know, limited number of users, single producer or one or two producers. Then that, that's managed like that. Over time, absolutely, Cadent would be the network operator. And then there will be a role for balancing, which we would expect in the first instance to be managed by them. But indeed, here in the UK, we have this kind of you know, ESO role emerging. And I think over time, we will find that that will take control of not only electricity, but gas and potentially hydrogen as well. Thank you. Yes, over there, please. Not yet. Can't hear you, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John yes. Gibbons, uh, UK CCSRC and University of Sheffield. Um, risks, very interesting. Could you say a bit more about the risks and particularly what you want the government to take? And also break those risks down into commercial and uh, maybe policy and technology. So those, those three headings. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I probably won't break it, uh, given the time, in all of those headings, but I will say, well, I, highlight, I will highlight so your Since we're at the technology conference, talk about the technology risks first, then, please. Oh, okay. I really want to talk. I, I, I have to say, I think the biggest challenge is actually the is the commercial risk. Yes, there are some technological risks in terms of... And are you expecting the government to take those? So how I would see it is, is two things. I think the, the technical risk... Let's take a hydrogen plant, a CCS enabled hydrogen plant. The private sector should build a plant like that and should take the responsibility for its technical operation. We run the kind of capture technologies day in, day out in chems. We do conversion of, hydrogen, of methane into hydrogen. They should take that risk. Again, using that as an example, there are two risks that the hydrogen plant cannot control. One is, is that CO2 transport and storage system going to be reliably there all the time? That is an economic and commercial chain that government has to, risk, has to step in and manage to a degree in the first instance, because you've got limited number of producers of CO2, limited number of stores. So you need to break the chain that way. The other one on the hydrogen one is, there is a risk in terms of offtake. So again, this is a new vector not being used before. If I lose an <coughs> off-taker, it will take a certain amount of time 
if at all, that I can bring a new one in. Now, once I've got 120 kilometers of hydrogen distribution system, I can be reasonably confident that within the space of a number of months, I might find another customer. In the first instance, government needs to do that. The models do include both of those, but I think I would say at the moment, I don't think they're sufficiently robust to be as generally financeable as they should be. Thank you. Thank you. I have okay. one more question, and I think we'll make this the last question, please, Simon. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Simon Blakey, uh, S&P Global Commodity Insights. Um, again, I have a question of Chris. Miguel, apologies for leaving you out um, about the, uh, the 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 CCA, uh, the storage project part of that you mentioned, the ENI um, yep. offshore gas field. Um, I see that the, um, there's a government report on the endurance um, saline aquifer storage um, uh, field in the North Sea that's, that, that's going to be used for the, the project cluster the other side of the Pennines from you. Um, and there's a, I, there's a quote in there saying that they're proving the saline aquifer because it's a worldwide proven concept while no benchmarking is currently available for injection into a depleted gas field. Do you see this as a potential barrier either really in terms of substance or even in terms of government perception? So, uh, first of all, I need to be clear, it is an E&I project, so I need to be careful what I say on their behalf in terms of the storage. Uh, I would make this general obs observation. When you are dealing with hydrocarbon stores that have been producing for 20 years, the level of geological understanding you have on the geology combined with actually what you know about the production rates and the depressurization of those fields and the characteristics does give you a, a 20 year or so legacy of data upon which you can make informed decisions. A saline line aquifer, it is going to be the first. Yeah, it, it, no, it's not necessarily completely first, but it is an early stage in terms of doing a saline line aquifer. So I would say there are, there are different characteristics of both. And I certainly would not say that doing a gas field injection is necessarily higher risk. I would actually say you have a better swathe of data to build upon. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, for the sake of time, move us on. And by saying uh, once again, thank you to both Miguel thank and you. Chris uh, for very informative and interesting discussion. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Too.